Hello and welcome to this short recording in which we're going to be discussing an incredibly meaningful and important condition known as haemophilia. On April the 17th, we will be observing World Haemophilia Day. World Haemophilia Day is a opportunity for us all to get a bit more education as to what this condition is, why it's significant, um, not just to the individuals who have it, but to their families and also to wider society. Did you know that one of the names for haemophilia is actually the royal disease? Because it is a condition that we have found occurring a bit more regularly, maybe than in the rest of the population, within the historic royal families of Europe. Um, indeed, what we think might have happened is that a haemophilia mutation, we'll talk a bit about that in a second, may have appeared either in Queen Victoria or her father. And because of the amount of children Queen Victoria had and the amount of inbreeding, for lack of a better word, that was going on in the royal family during the 19th, early 20th century, this haemophilia mutation was actually quite common within the royal families of Europe. And indeed, just to kind of show about how diseases can actually have significant historical effects, perhaps one of the most famous people who had haemophilia was Alexei, um, the last Tsarevich or prince of the Romanov dynasty in Russia. He was very poorly um, with haemophilia, and a lot of people think that because of the condition and the steps that, that his parents took to care for this child, that they may actually have contributed to a lot of the kind of unrest that was going on in Russia during the early 20th century and may have contributed significantly to the Russian Revolution of 1917. So a disease of massive significance. Let's talk a bit more about it. As conditions go, it is a relatively rare condition. Although having said that, there are thousands of people with haemophilia in the United Kingdom. And one of the hallmarks of haemophilia is that a patient's blood just won't clot. So usually when we have a little cut, we'll know after a few seconds, few minutes, there'll be a scab and we'll stop bleeding. In patients with haemophilia, this just doesn't happen or it happens much slower than it would in other individuals. And as a result of this, people with haemophilia are very susceptible to excessive bleeding. Even think cuts and injuries that would be relatively trivial for people who don't have haemophilia can actually be life-threatening for people with haemophilia. So why doesn't their blood clot? Well, in humans, we have a large number of different proteins that are called coagulation factors. These all work together to build a blood clot that will stop us from losing blood. And in haemophilia, individuals have a mutation in one of these coagulation factors that stop them from working. And because these don't work, we can't form a blood clot. There are two main forms of haemophilia, haemophilia A and haemophilia B. Haemophilia A is caused by a mutation in a gene called factor VIII, and haemophilia B is caused by a mutation in factor IX. Without either of those two proteins, forming a blood clot is very, very difficult. Another interesting fact for you, it used to be that haemophilia B was called Christmas disease. Not because it was discovered around Christmas or anything like that, but it was actually named after the surname of one of the first patients, a Mr. Christmas, um, in which it was first discovered. We don't like to name diseases after people or places anymore, so we've changed the name so it's haemophilia B. And that leads me on to another point, really, that when we look at the patients who have haemophilia, be it haemophilia A or haemophilia B, the vast majority of patients who have this condition are male. That's because the genes for factor VIII and factor IX are located on the X chromosome. Men only have a single copy of the X chromosome, whereas women have two. 
if women have one copy of the gene which isn't working, it doesn't matter because chances are they'll have a second copy on their second X chromosome which works perfectly fine. Whereas with men, if the version of the factor 8 or factor 9 gene that we have on our single X chromosome doesn't work, then the consequence will be haemophilia. We diagnose haemophilia, usually with a blood test. The blood test will very, very quickly see if an individual is able to form a blood clot or not. But we might also find that other techniques can actually be quite useful, because one of the things that we see in very kind of severe uh, haemophilia is that people will actually bleed into their joints, such as the knee joint, which will cause the knee to swell and become very, very painful. And we can actually see this bleeding into the knee joint using imaging things like x-rays, for example. Diagnosing haemophilia early is absolutely essential for ensuring that the individual has a good quality of life. And thankfully, we are now in a position where treating haemophilia is relatively effective and compared to where we were just even a few decades ago, is relatively low risk for the patients involved. So that individuals with haemophilia can now expect a much, much longer life expectancy than people with haemophilia 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, for example, we treat haemophilia now by injecting patients with the correct version of these clotting factors that we've grown in the lab. Before, the way that we used to treat patients with haemophilia was by transfusing them with blood plasma from other patients. This was quite risky and actually did lead to a number of patients with haemophilia catching infections like hepatitis C and HIV, which is one of the reasons why we don't really use that anymore and we prefer these recombinant factors, as they're called, you know, factors that we've grown in sterile conditions within a lab. And this kind of takes me to why awareness of these conditions is so important, because raising awareness of these conditions can make people come forward to get diagnosed, that they're aware of what their treatment options are, but also one of you listening might kind of become interested by this and decide that for your career you're wanting to kind of conduct research into this condition to find new and novel ways of treating it. So for example genetic engineering which is possibly the next step in developing treatment for haemophilia. Thank you very much for listening, hope you learned something and I hope you found it enjoyable.